Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 38. In this lecture, we'll discuss angular kinematics. This topic is covered in Chapter 10 of our textbook by Sirwe and Jouette. In our last lecture, we learned about the angular motion variables, theta, omega, and alpha. These are the angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration of a rotating object. The mathematical structure of these variables should remind you of the linear motion variables that you learned about a while back. For example, theta should remind you of linear position, x, while angular velocity should remind you of linear velocity, v, which was defined as dx dt. Alpha should remind you of linear acceleration, which was simply dv dt. It turns out there's a great deal of similarity between the angular motion variables and the linear motion variables. In particular, the ways in which the angular variables are related to each other are quite similar, in fact, you could even say identical from a mathematical point of view, to the ways in which the linear motion variables are related to each other. More specifically, the kinematic equations that dictate the behavior of theta, omega, and alpha are very similar to the kinematic equations that relate x, v, and a. We learned back in chapter 2 that when discussing the linear motion of an object, like a box sliding across the floor, we can use this set of equations, known as the kinematic equations, to relate the motion variables x, v, and a. It turns out when discussing the rotational or angular motion of an object, like a spinning disk, we can use a similar set of equations to relate the angular motion variables. This set of equations on the right hand is known as the angular kinematic equations. I will not derive the angular kinematic equations for you. I will only say that the derivation is exactly the same as the derivation for the linear kinematic equations that we saw back in chapter 2. In fact, if you compare these two equations, you'll notice that the equations on the right are really identical to the ones on the left, except that x has been replaced by theta, a has been replaced by alpha, and v has been replaced by omega. So this set of equations from a mathematical point of view um, are really identical. And this should not be surprising. After all, x, v, and a are related to each other in exactly the same way that theta, omega, and alpha are related through derivatives. So when discussing the angular motion or rotational motion of an object, we can use the angular kinematics equations and the way we use them is exactly the same way as we use the linear kinematics equations. So we might use one equation, for example, to find time, and then we might substitute that in a second equation to find, let's say, the final angular velocity of an object. The mathematics, the algebra involved for these two sets of equations is exactly the same. However, from a physical point of view, the difference is that on the left, we might be interested in the linear displacement of an object, whereas on the right we might be interested in the angular displacement of an object. On the left we might be talking about meters, on the right we would be talking about radians, but the algebra for solving for these quantities would be exactly the same. Looking at the linear kinematic equations and the angular kinematic equations side by side, should suggest to you that there are some intimate connections between the linear motion variables and the angular motion variables. To understand those connections, let's consider the rotational motion of the object shown here. We have an object of some arbitrary shape, and it is rotating around some arbitrary point O. So point O does not have to be the center of mass, it's just any arbitrary random point. As the object rotates around point O, we can say that the axis of rotation lies along this line here, which we can call the z-axis for convenience. Now we're going to focus our attention on a specific point of this object. So imagine zooming in on a single atom of mass m located right here on the object. 
as the object rotates, the atom executes circular motion. So the path traced out by that particular atom is going to be a circle with its center at point O. We can say that this particular atom has some linear velocity. The velocity vector would be tangent to the circular path that the atom traces out. Of course, as the object rotates around point O, it has some angular velocity. Remember that the angular velocity vector points along the axis of rotation. To figure out whether you should draw omega pointing up or down, you have to use the right hand rule. You place your wrist at point O, you curl your four fingers in the direction of V, in the direction that the object is rotating, and then you stick out your thumb, and in this case you would see that your thumb on your right hand points upwards, and that's the omega vector. Now clearly the omega vector and the V vector must be related somehow. They have different orientations, but their magnitudes must be related somehow because the faster the object rotates, the faster this particular atom moves. To discover the relationship between V and omega, we must recall the arc length formula from geometry. Remember from geometry that the length of an arc traversed by a point is equal to R theta. So S is the distance along the arc or along the circumference of the circle. R is simply the radius of the circle from point O to where the atom is located. And theta is the angle through which the, um, this particular line here, the radial line, is displaced. Remember that for this formula to work, theta must be in radians, not degrees. If we differentiate both sides of this equation, we get the relationship that we want. The derivative of s with respect to t is v, and the derivative of theta with respect to t is omega. This relationship tells us that the linear speed of that particular atom is equal to the radius of that particular atom times the angular velocity or magnitude of the angular velocity of the object. Note that to obtain this relationship, I differentiated both sides of this equation here. Differentiating the left side gives me speed because speed is essentially telling me how fast the object is moving along the arc of a circle. Differentiating the right side, we need to recognize that the radius of the circle is a constant, so you can bring it out of the derivative. And of course, d theta dt is simply omega. Now that we recognize there is a relationship between the magnitudes of these vectors, it's worthwhile thinking about the acceleration vectors as well. Recall that if an object is executing circular motion, it must have some acceleration. In general, the acceleration vector, the linear acceleration vector, points into the circle. If the motion is uniform circular motion, then the acceleration vector points directly to the center. If it's non-uniform circular motion, if the object is speeding up or slowing down, then the acceleration vector is going to point off center. So the acceleration vector is going to be a little more complicated because in general it will have a tangential component and it will have a radial component. It will have a component along the tangent to the circle and a component along the radius of the circle. It turns out those two components can be related to the angular motion variables. The tangential component is equal to r alpha, while the radial component is equal to r omega squared. In these equations, I've placed the uh, tangential and the radial components inside absolute value signs because you must decide on the sign of these two components based on how the object is rotating. So these formulas give us the, the absolute values, but remember that components can be positive or negative. To figure those out, you have to use the right-hand rule and think about conventions about circular motion. At least one of these equations should already be familiar to you. Recall that in general, the radial component of acceleration is equal to v squared over r. That's exactly what this equation is telling us. Notice that we have already written v as r uh, times omega. If we rearrange this, we can write this equation as r 
v over r quantity squared which after simplification gives us v squared over r. To be precise we need to put a minus sign in front of this but of course here for now we're talking about absolute value signs. The set of equations that you see here these four equations are incredibly important because they connect all the linear motion variables that we learned about a long time ago to the angular motion variables that we're now learning. Let's do a practice problem involving both linear motion variables and angular motion variables. A car is traveling at a speed of 13 meters per second. It begins to accelerate at a constant rate, reaching a speed of 19 meters per second in six seconds. Each of the four identical tires has a mass of 15 kilograms and a radius of 0.4 meters. Find the initial and final angular speeds of the tires. Also find the angular acceleration of the tires. Notice that the problem itself gives you a lot of linear information and then it asks for angular information. So when we're told that a car is traveling at a speed of 13 meters per second, what we're really talking about is the linear speed of the, of the car. You're supposed to deduce that essentially based on the units involved. So when you see 13 meters per second as opposed to 13 radians per second, you should be thinking that uh, v is equal to 13 meters per second. A little more precisely, we should say v initial is equal to 13 meters per second. Maybe even more precisely, although it's unnecessary in this problem, we could say v initial in the x direction is equal to 13 meters per second. It begins to accelerate at a constant rate, reaching a speed of 19 meters uh, per second in six seconds. So this 19 meters per second is base, basically the final velocity in the x direction. And of course, six seconds is simply delta t. Each of the four identical tires has a mass of 15 kilograms. It turns out the 15 kilograms will not be relevant in this problem, and the radius is 0.4 meters. Finding the initial and final angular speeds is easy because we have a relationship between angular and linear velocities. We know that omega is equal to v over r, and that implies that omega initial should be 32.5 radians per second, and omega final should be 47.5 radians per second. Finding the angular acceleration requires just a little bit more work, Remember that alpha is the change in omega with respect to time. Delta omega is omega final minus omega initial. We figured out omega final and omega initial in part A, so we can subtract those. Divide by delta t and we find that the angular acceleration of the tires is 2.5 radians per second squared. Incidentally, part B could also be answered in a slightly different manner. We could remember that alpha is equal to the tangential acceleration divided by r. The tangential acceleration is dv dt, and we know how v changes, the speed, the linear speed of the car changes from 13 to 19, so we can subtract um, initial from final, divide by time, remember to divide by the radius, and we would get 2.5 radians per second squared, exactly the same answer as we got before. So the fact that there is a relationship between the linear and tangential, uh, the linear and the angular variables implies that we can answer this question in two equivalent ways. Let's continue the same problem. Part C of the same problem says find the angular displacement of the tires. So again, remember that this problem gives us lots of linear information and it's asking for angular information. To figure out the angular displacement, delta theta, we now need to use the angular kinematic equations. Remember that theta final is equal to theta initial plus omega initial times t plus one half alpha t squared. We know all of these variables. We can assume that theta initial is zero. We figured out omega initial in part A of this problem, and we figured out alpha in part B of this problem. Substituting those numbers in, we find that the angular displacement is 240 radians. In other words, during this six second period, the tires rotate through 240 radians. 
We can answer the same question in a slightly different way. We can use one of our linear kinematic equations to figure out the linear distance traveled. We can say x initial is 0, v initial is given to us as 13, and we can calculate the linear acceleration. Substituting that information in, we find that the linear distance traveled is 96 meters. And then we recall the arc length formula, which tells us theta is equal to s over r. The distance traveled is 96, the radius of the tire is 0.4, and we get exactly the same answer as before, 240 radians. Once again, the connection between the linear and angular variables is giving us two equivalent ways of answering this question. It's nice to calculate the answer both ways as a check on your calculations. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.